Well, my friends, will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, truly may the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. I, I'm sorry. Oh, not today. There's no children's message today. So, but thank you, Anthony. Um, now I'm back. Focus, Susan. It's Love Our Church Month. It is Love Our Youth Month and celebration of, of the upcoming plans that the youth have. We, we want to make every February celebrating youth and making sure that they have fundraisers and things to go on their mission trips and special trips. We want to just also show our youth and our young people appreciation all the time. We want you to know how much we love you and value your presence and what you teach us in the life of this church. And so youth, we love you. And we start off saying that today. It is Love Our Church Month as well. That could be a hashtag, something you want to put on Facebook, maybe a reason why I love my church. Just every Sunday, and you're coming and going, and you're prepping or leaving to be in this place of worship, to acknowledge to God, hashtag love my church people, hashtag love my church snacks, whatever it is, hashtag love the energy, or the positive nature of hearing God's word in my church. That's a really long hashtag, but you can still write it out. We love our church. At least we should say that, and we should be in prayer for that all the time. It is so valuable. I know I've had the opportunity to go be in a variety of churches, I guess as myself, and as a superintendent in the district, in, in the conference. One of my jobs as a pastor was to be a district superintendent, which means I, I was a resource to our bishop and relating to, uh, it was like 157 churches in the Northeast District. And that meant 110 pastors. And every once in a while, I'd be on the road and I'd pop in different churches and I'd see what it was like. Churches small and in the cornfield and churches lard, large and lard. Churches large, churches small, all shapes and sizes. One of the days as a superintendent, I had to go to a church for their last worship service. It was their closing service. They'd gotten to the point where they felt like they couldn't sustain and carry on and, and they just needed to close and send the life of the church on to the next worshiping body that would be there. And so we had a special service plan. And, and so what do we want to say and celebrate about the life of this church? So you think in your mind, what would I add to a conversation like that about what my church meant to me? There was a woman who was probably in her 50s and she said she grew up in the church. She'd moved away. She was home just for that closing worship. And I, put a, I pulled this picture from Google. It, it's similar to what I saw in that little country church, and it was a church in a cornfield. And there weren't any houses around it. It just sort of stood out like a postcard with the field around it and the, and the vegetation. But there, imagine behind the cross on the altar a green curtain, okay? And this woman stood up, and she just told about how she grew up in the church and what it meant to be there for her. And she kept looking kind of quizzitively and she said, you know, I've always wondered something. I said, well, go ahead and ask, whatever it is. And she said, I wonder what's behind the curtain. <laughs> what is behind the curtain? And I said, after all this time, you never just tiptoed up here to, to peek? You just wondered, and it left a certain mystery for her, a certain sacred nature of the space, almost like she couldn't pass beyond the altar table. It, it's reminiscent of the Jewish temple in Israel, there was a curtain, and the Holy of Holies was behind it. So I said, no time like the present. Let's go look. And I pulled the curtain back, and it was just wall. <laughs> no surprises. Not even a Bobby Sue was here or, or any kind of inscription about what maybe could have been back there. I don't know. No, no surprise picture of Jesus. No hanging Ten Commandments. It was just the wall. But the mystery for her was solved, right? Sacred space. I, I also pulled a picture. My brother sent this to me from Christmas Eve where they sat, I guess, in the back back row of the balcony. This is my home church in Colorado Springs and it is huge. I mean, it is a large sanctuary and it's very beautiful. It's from like the 1920s. It's got a lot of art deco feel to it. And I grew up there. there. There's no mystery to that space. I know that space. Even though they change the paint color and sometimes the chancel area gets redone, 
that is my church. I would know it anywhere. I ran around in that space at lock-ins overnight with the youth group. I know what it looks like at 2 a.m. in the dark. I know every place to hide when you play hide-and-seek and sardines in the church. I know where they keep stuff that they're not supposed to let young people find. You know, you don't want them to get into. I just, I know that building. That is the place, not where I was baptized, because we moved there after I'd been baptized. But it is the place where I grew up doing children's choirs and handbells, and I tried to help the youth with my flute solo sometimes I never was very good at that I got so nervous if you can imagine and then there were times confirmation where I knelt down and was confirmed in the life of the church and joined as as a member of that church there were times where I came and knelt down for communion and my dad who was an usher would pass the plate to me there were times that was the place where I did my first sermon no better place than your home church and then I was married there that's my place Sometimes I'm blessed to go home and visit my place. I love my church for all of those reasons. But it's not the building. It's the people. It's the connection. I was telling the confirmation class, I can still go in the door of my church, and there is Harvey McAnulty, who, is, who was my mentor in confirmation. And he'll hug me still. And, he, and, and that's a connection to people, a God's person who prayed for me when I was 12 and still embraces me now when I'm older than that. <laughs> Confirmation, sacred space. It is the place where God peopled my story with the loving people of the body of Christ. And maybe that's what you love too about your church. Not the walls, not the space, but the people. So what is it to love the church? It is to love the people. As I was a superintendent, I would go around and ask the question, what do you love about your church? And I'd get all those, I've talked about this before, everything started with the letter F. Family, food, fellowship, food, and family, and friendships. You know? And then they, they talk about loving their church because of the feeling of connection, that you could go in and never be alone, that there was always somebody who would talk to you. At least that's the hope, right? That seems like a pretty low bar, that somebody will talk to you. It should be more than one somebody, right? It should be lots of somebodies who will find you and talk to you and include you and welcome you. No matter the size, the shape, the design, or the location, no matter what it's like physically, the church is a designated place for God's presence to dwell. That's what it was through scripture, right? Even a floating, moving tabernacle or, or the building of the house of the Lord before the temple was built. It is the place to celebrate God's presence and dwelling amongst us. It's a place set apart. It's true we can encounter God everywhere, but it's nice to have a place to be set apart for his ministry and his purpose. It's a tangible place so you can see and experience. Finally, what is love for the church? It's to be that place that settles the need and the longing and appreciation and desire for God's connective space that we are with the people of God and with God when we're here. It is to build us up. It is to light us up. Even when we stream online and you're watching from home or when you're traveling or you just couldn't make it one day, to tune in is to receive that transmission of God's message and to still be connected. I love when folks on Facebook say, I'm here, good morning, praise be, you know, and, and make that time to mark, I'm with you. I was in worship with you. We love things about our church, and we might all have a different answer. You, you could shout it out now. I wonder how many things we'd hear that are different. What do you love about your church? People. I already answered it for you already. What else? <laughs> Sunday school, where you learn and grow in faith about all kinds of things, Jesus and the Bible. What else do you love? Food. Food. <laughs> There's some on the table right back there, too, still <laughs> to grab compassion and ministries and mission and outreach where the love of God is shared with those who need it and every need is different what else spirit. the spirit the Holy Spirit the divine presence in our lives what about the table of the Lord sacrament communion celebrating a baptism and welcoming in a new member of the family of God these are extremely special things hear the love for the church in that psalm 
It is a psalm, it is one of the 15 psalms set aside that are called the Songs of Ascent. They are 15 spiritual songs about a pilgrimage journey to go into God's presence. This is a picture of a modern day pilgrimage to the temple steps in Jerusalem. And the idea was that as travelers would come from their home to the temple, they would read or recite or sing one of these songs of ascent at every step. They, they would take the time to prepare in their hearts to be in God's presence by sharing in those common words and songs. They were meant to be preparation for entering the holy space of God. Now, it was a dangerous trip for many in, in the time when the psalm was written. It was an expensive journey. And the men were encouraged to go three times a year for the festivals. And, and in the psalm, it said, we're here to give thanks. It was probably on the way to the, the festival of the, of the booths, which was for harvest thanks, to give thanks for God's bounty and a plentiful harvest, and to go on a pilgrimage to the house of the Lord and be in God's presence with God's people. And that's why he writes, you look at Jerusalem and you see unity, that we come from all different places and perspectives and homes and our busyness of our lives, and we set down in God's space, united. So what Jerusalem was... For the Israelites and the, the psalmist, the church is for the believer. It is the place of God's peace. It is the place of God's unity and our hopes and our efforts joined together to glorify God and to build one another up in faith. It's where we accept one another, the sinners that we are, and accept one another in grace and compassion and forgiveness. It is the place where we ex accept one another for all that we bring to the table for who God made us to be. Often the danger when we come here, and it's true, and everybody's been here, and you might be feeling it right now, sometimes it's just we come out of habit. It's just routine. For the psalmist, he was rejoicing. Did you hear that first line again? I said, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Is it stirred up in you? Is this very rare experience to go to the temple? soul stirring and of course it isn't meant to be routine and the form of worship without the joy it should always be cheerleaders for our faith and let that inner cheerleader out and that enthusiasm out and let the whole spirit come upon you and be excited and burning and on passion for being in the house of the Lord if that rings true to you Hear this commentary I read from a 50-year-old commentary. It was so great, what it said about loving church and what is it. It said, if the building is of people, in that if it's about commemorating architecture and space, if it's, if it's just about the building, it's an exercise in vanity. It doesn't generate joy. However, if the intention and practice of, of a real sanctuary of God comes through, it will be through all changing times a symbol of unity, a place of fellowship, inspiration, and dedication. It is our soul's hope that when we come and connect with the people we love and love our church and filled with the Holy Spirit and open to it, we will leave feeling that fellowship and inspiration and a renewed dedication. We love our church because it unites us because it brings us together for a common purpose, to dedicate ourselves to God, to love others freely and grow in faith, to participate and attend to the means of grace. What are the means of grace? Worship, prayer, fasting. Who's doing that today, Super Bowl? Nobody, anyone? And the sacraments. Participating in the Lord's table like we do today. This set-apart time for those who want to remember the works of Jesus Christ and take in his grace again. One of the things it says is that we seek a church. Anyone who's seeking a church may look and find clues on the building about what they'll find. Driving down the road, do you see and recognize a church right away? We may miss some. When I leave here, I like to count the number of churches I see and I try to take different routes so I can find different churches. 
I like to count them and, and witness them, whether by steeple or a picture of a cross on a storefront window. What is it that sets a church apart so that I know that if there's someone driving behind me who's seeking God, that they will see a place to be? The success of one church is the success of all, right? I'll tell you another story about, about being a superintendent visiting a church. There was one day where my presence literally doubled the attendance. There was one man on the front row listening to the sermon. And I thought, I snob that I am. I thought, well, how is this worship? What is this? How could this be what it's like week to week? How, did, how come they didn't close a long time ago? And then I remembered, what does it say? Where two or three are gathered in my name. And he was getting a lot out of the message. I mean, that guy was an amen responder. Everything that the pastor said was amen. He went home having heard the word and the spirit. Who am I to judge what makes worship valid for somebody else, right? He felt it, he knew it, and he was there. And I just got to add to their number. It was a gift to me. One of the things I've learned, too, along the way, I was a general conference delegate which mean I was elected by the Methodists in Arkansas to go to our big global meeting in 2012. I was really fired up about it. It's really hard work. Every United Methodist can send a petition, a resolution to, to structure the Methodist church, say, I think we should do this, I think we should do this. And there's an important one coming up this month. But I was assigned to the legislative committee about church property. And this is not my strong suit. And there were hundreds of amendments about what it means to have church property or get wills and documents and how to have structure on your grounds and what your facility should do. And there were rules about closing churches, what process to do to close a church. And the, one of our brothers from Africa, I don't know which country he was from because I, couldn't, I wasn't sitting close enough to see his name tag, but he stood up and he said, I don't understand. I don't understand why we're talking about closing churches. Is that a problem? It is. Churches close every day in this country. Why? I appreciate what he was saying. He was coming from a place, our church, the Methodist church and others, Protestant churches are growing like, like wildfire in parts of Africa and the Philippines and South Korea and Cuba. Where are there parts of the world that are only the joy of opening churches? What does it mean when a, when a church has run its course and when it closes? I really appreciate it. I'll never forget what he said. Why are we even talking about this? What does it mean about our responsibility? Did, did, the, did the community just move away and the church closed? Or was it too far out or too far one way politically or too far something else? We, what was it that it got to the point where it had run its course? I'm just reminded of what love of church means about priority and attention and fostering all we can to continue to build a future for it. One of the things I read was why I love church. What is love for church is it is the very meeting place where heaven and earth connect. The very meeting place where heaven and earth connect week to week. And he thought, without church as a refuge and a space of fellowship with God, without this holy intersection of being in God's place, what would there be in the void without it? Frenzy would take the place. Such a good word, frenzy. I mean, really, what, what would the world be without the body of Christ? Whether in a building or whether just in the, in the world with the people. What would it be like? Chaos and frenzy and pain and selfishness and suffering and isolation. And I guess the list could go on and on. So our job, my friends, is that the peace that we seek from the church, from the body of believers, comes in the shape of compassion and completeness and validation and acceptance and affirmation and compassion and hope and justice and gratitude. And if the peace of God, like the psalmist wrote, if the peace of God takes all of those shapes... That is our constant prayer, that the place, the house of the Lord will always offer those shapes of peace for whatever kind of peace you need today, whatever kind of peace you need today and tomorrow and the next generation. So how does one get 
this love of church? How do you get it? How do you keep it going? How do you enact it? Every church is extremely important, and every church needs the love of its people and the prayers of its people. In that last part of the scripture, the psalmist wrote three ways to pray for your church. Remember, it's a psalm of preparation for even entering the space of God. And he writes, pray, I pray that Jerusalem has peace, that let those who love you have rest. Let there be peace on your walls. For the sake of my family and friends, I say, peace be with you, Jerusalem. For the sake of the Lord our God's house, I will pray for your good. Every church we see is an instrument of God's peace. Every church we see needs the prayers. There's no competition. There's just the success of each. That we pray for God to be glorified in every space and to build more and to open more and close less. That it is our responsibility, our duty, to be on fire for God, to rejoice in Christ, to offer the church to the world. We should pray that worship will continue always, that peace, prosperity, protection, and provision for the church will never end. Pray for what's good for the whole church and the churches that need to be in connection with God. Pray for the people whom you love and let the whole church feel the love. May you always know what it is to rejoice in God and to be present with one another. May you always rejoice at what it means to come to the Lord's table and be welcome. For the United Methodist Church, the table is open to anyone who believes and wishes to receive. The table is open to anyone who wants to know more about Jesus Christ and his message of forgiveness and grace. This is the table of God, and it is open to us. It is the table of God that is meant to be for sinners and those who are seeking God's peace in all of its forms, compassion and hope and justice and mercy and acceptance and freedom in Christ. This is the Lord's table. This is the gift of Christ's body, and it was given for us when he ate supper with his friends at the last meal before he was betrayed and handed over for his suffering and his death. He took the bread that was ordinary bread and he offered a prayer that God would make it extraordinary and change it for them and change their minds about its meaning. For he said, this is my body which is given for you. As often as you're together, take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup and again gave thanks and he gave it to God and he said, drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of a new covenant and is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you're together, church, do this in remembrance of me. And so we join together when we get to come to this place of refuge and we get to come to this place of connection and renewal that we open ourselves to the gift of the Holy Spirit and ready our hearts to receive the gift of God's forgiveness. We do that by offering a prayer of confession in our hearts. Submit to God, lay it at the foot of the cross. What is it that you need to give over to accept that peace, to be pardoned and redeemed again? Pray in your hearts, my friends, and make your confession to God. Almighty God, we do pray that we have sometimes failed to be your obedient church. We've sometimes failed to show love to all who seek it. We sometimes fail to just be welcoming. We fail to see, Lord God, where, where strangers need your, your guiding touch and to know the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord God, where we have made mistakes, erase them. Where we have been counted, Lord, as sinners, Help us to be redeemed by your blood. Take away our sin and set us free for a new and joyful and obedient life. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the church. 
where we may receive this pardon and be set out into the world, your servants, to share your good news. Come upon these gifts, Lord God, by your Holy Spirit. Come upon them the bread and the fruit of the vine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That in taking and receiving them, we will be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one in ministry to all the world, and one in ministry to each other until we feast together at the heavenly banquet. We ask this through your son, Jesus Christ, who taught disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>